Our worship theme this month is wings. In September, we explored our Unitarian Universalist history and we called the theme Roots. And this month, we'll consider how that Unitarian Universalist theology and history compels us to action in our current context. That means we're going to talk a lot about a lot of hard stuff this month. And I realize that there are dangers to setting aside an entire month to talk about hard stuff. First of all, social justice belongs in our hearts and on our lips every day of the year, not just four Sundays in a particular month. But secondly, it can feel overwhelming, and I worry that people might start to tune out. That's especially true when we're talking about a subject as all-encompassing and all terrible as climate change. It is profoundly personal, yet maddeningly abstract at the same time. It's something that we tend to talk about in terms of science, but it is also deeply emotional. It impacts every person on the planet, but we do not have a shared ground of reality from which we can talk about it. It's confusing and it's awful, and it can make us feel numb and hopeless. Yet as complicated and scary as it is, we have got to do something. But what? After a lot of thought, discernment, really wrestling with it, I decided I'm, I'm just not gonna answer that question today. And here's why. We have a social and an environmental justice committee that can answer that question for you. In fact, they very much would like to answer that question. We also have a climate action team who has some very specific actions that they hope we will take. I hope we will take those actions as well. I want to be explicit in my support of the good work of both of these groups in our congregation. There's no reason for me to do that work too. I urge you to seek out specific action items from them. <coughs> What I can bring to this subject is not so much what I hope you'll do, but how I hope you'll do it. And maybe also some things I hope that you don't do. To my mind, there are some predictable, perfectly understandable, but debilitating pitfalls that plague the environmental work, maybe all of the social justice work, Unitarian Universalists. I want to lift up three of those pitfalls today. They are cynicism, hopelessness, and smug self-assurance. I have found myself in each of these pitfalls at some point in my relationship with environmental work and Unitarian Universalism. But perhaps the one that is nearest and closest to my heart is cynicism. Cynicism first got me hard about 10 years ago when I read a nonfiction book by Barbara Kingsolder titled Animal Vegetable Miracle. It is an account of her family's attempts to only eat foods that were sourced within 100 miles of their Kentucky farm. And one of the reasons for doing this was to reduce their carbon footprint. Based on what I read in the book and some other factors, I came to the decision, after 10 years of being a vegetarian who sometimes ate fish, 10 years of that, I came to the, to the decision that it was time to start eating meat again. Lowering my carbon footprint was one of the reasons that I had stopped eating meat. And while it remains true that eating meat, especially from factory farms, creates a host of negative environmental impacts, I had never taken into consideration the carbon footprint caused by eating fruits and vegetables out of season. I didn't realize the massive amount of petroleum that it requires to create the pesticides, the harvesting, processing, trucking, and frozen storage required to produce one veggie burger. <coughs> now I realize that Barbara Kingsolver is not an environmental scientist, and this was not an environmental impact study, but she's not wrong. 
and it broke my little 30-year-old heart to realize that the choices that I had made, that the sacrifices that I had made, had not only failed to reduce my carbon footprint, they had probably made it worse. And although a rutabaga grown in my own county in a winter month has a lower footprint than a banana from Guatemala in any month, Guess who doesn't want to eat rutabagas? <laughs> Especially over a banana. <laughs> so I got a little cynical about my ability to do anything to prevent climate change. I felt like whatever I did had this potential to betray me. And it hardened my heart. And the sense of the enormity and the opacity rendered me hopeless. Cynicism and hopelessness are twins, especially in the subject of climate change. I got fooled, and so I gave up. What's the point anyway? I thought, even if I lived on Ruta Vegas, it doesn't do anything about the massive amounts of carbon produced by big business, foreign governments, and our own military. My personal contributions will never offset the damage created by these entities, so why does it matter what I do? My hopelessness about the climate crisis is rooted in the belief that I am too small to create any positive impact, but I am just big enough to create a negative impact. <sighs> so that's cynicism and hopelessness which leaves us with smugness. <laughs> now at this point, I can hear some of you thinking about what you're going to say to me in the receiving line. <laughs> well, the joke's on you, there is no receiving line today. <laughs> that affirms the relationship we share rather than a drive-by quip about something you think I should know. <laughs> and I'm not alone in that. I want to acknowledge that Unitarian Universalists have indeed been on the forefront of the environmental movement from the beginning. And that is something that we can be proud of. But I also like to offer a note of caution Sometimes we, you use, can be a little overly confident about how good we are at things. We have a tendency towards smug satisfaction action, and we can be a little overbearing in our conviction that we are right and that everyone else should do what we are doing because we are right. Let us keep fresh before us that we have not always been right. And sometimes, in fact, we have been painfully, horribly wrong, and we could be wrong again. <clears throat> it is unendingly ironic that a church founded on the premises that we can't know it all has yielded such confidence that we probably do know it. <laughs> we enjoy being smart and ethical so much that we can miss the importance of relationships in creating change. If we rush in and tell people what they should be doing absent of the context of a relationship, an actual relationship where we know them and they know us, and we understand their lives, the chances of them doing what we so clearly told them to do are very low. Nobody likes a casual observer who is full of facts, figures, ideas, and dare I say, judgments. Being unassailably right does not change people's beliefs or behaviors. Even if we paint it in the bleakest, most research-driven picture of our planet's miserable future. Over 
the intervening decade since Barbara King Solor ruined my youthful environmental efforts, our species has sailed through warning signs and through desperate pleas from our scientific community. We have passed the point of being able to stop climate change. Now we're talking about how to cope with it. It seems for every victory that there are two defeats. We have to find another way to reach people. And action is a luxury we can no longer afford. We must put away the adolescent cynicism, the hand-wringing hopelessness, and the smug self-assurance. They have not yielded the results that we need. The time for doomsday prophesying and sanctimonious anger wagging is over. Climate change is an existential crisis in the truest sense of the phrase. Churches are in the business of framing and examining existential crises. It's kind of what we're here for. The question is, what is the Unitarian Universalist perspective on climate change? Well, we're against it. <laughs> but what I mean is, what do we, as a religious voice, have to offer to this conversation? What can we do that no one else is doing? And more specifically for our conversation today, what part of our history might we draw from to add to this discussion? Some of you may remember learning about Hosea Ballou a few months ago. He was not the founder of American Universalism, but he was one of the strongest voices of that tradition. He published a lot. As a Universalist, Ballou rejected the idea of hell. His position on future punishment was supported by the evidence that future punishment, as a doctrine, had not solved the issue of sin. No matter what scare tactics a preacher or a church might use to curtail immoral behavior, people's behavior remained basically the same. Therefore, fear was not an appropriate tactic to creating change. Instead, he sought to motivate people to a higher standard of morality through love. To this end, Jose Ballou was famous for sermons that emphasized love over fear. It was a radically different message than the Hellfire and Brimstone sermon that was very popular at this time. He preached about a loving God, a God that had left the task of creating a peaceable kingdom in the hands of humanity. Our universalist forebears believed that humans sinned out of confusion or necessity, not because we are inherently sinful. It was through the power of love that peace, justice, and righteousness would be wrought upon the earth. If we had, if we had heard this message and we understood this message of how much God loves us, we would naturally respond with love for God and love for each other. Love would bring about the perfect conditions that would end the reign of sin on earth, not fear. Love. Adam Robersmith has written beautifully about this in an essay which is found in the book Justice on Earth, which is also where our earlier reading was found. I commend that book to you if you haven't read it, especially for Robersmith's essay. Adam argues that the time has come for us to reach for this gem in our theological toolbox. And I think he's right. Knowing that our actions have damaged, potentially destroyed our planet, has not changed our behavior. Being confronted with facts and figures and art, influxes of refugees, the pleas of our children, increasingly powerful natural disasters, has not changed our behavior. Perhaps Baloo was right. Fear cannot drive change. Only love can do. What we need, beloved, is a conversion experience. What we've done and what we continue to do to our planet can only act 
accurately be called sin. We know that. And yet we have not turned from our sinful ways. Let's take a page from the loo and flip the script on the subject. This conversation, this conversion, this conversion of the heart from cynicism, hopelessness, and or smugness cannot be led by more cynicism, hopelessness, and smugness. What if, instead of focusing on all the things that we're doing wrong and the damage that we've caused and continue to cause, what if, instead, we focus on how much we love this earth and how it is sacred to us? What if when we talk to others, we ground ourselves in relationship and hold each other in love? Knowing the cynicism and hopelessness that has held someone back from taking action is the same as ours. Borrowing from the lose work, let us affirm that we have not sinned against our environment because there is something inherently broken in us. It is a confusion and a necessity that has caused people to sin. And if we want to change our behavior, we have to love our planet and each other so hard that others will want to join us in our work from that place of relationality. If we move from love, others will be naturally attracted to us and to our work. We need to be honest about the situation, but not reactive. Focused, centered, grounded in love. The world does not need more people who know things. It needs more people who are loving. Now is the time for us to proclaim a different message. When everyone else is preaching hellfire and brimstone, let us preach about love in the great tradition of Hosea Ballou. If we are the inheritors of his ideas, then it is our role to use them whenever and however we can. That is our unique voice in the work of climate action. This is the unique thing that we can contribute. We need to show up, and we need to get to work. But let us do it out of love for our earth, love for our fellows that share the earth with us. Love over fear. Let's change the conversation and the motivation to love over fear. Real love, the love from which we cannot be separated, but the love that lives within, around, among, and through us. May it be so. Amen.